Okay, so hello everybody. Um, it's great to see you all again. This is the AFMS seminar uh, for this week, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Mithul Luha. So Dr. Luha is an Associate Professor of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering at the University of Southern California. His research interests include wall-bounded turbulent flows and fluid structure interactions, and he's kindly uh, sharing some of his work with us today. So please take it away, Mithul. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the invitation to present in the seminar series, um, and thanks for the introduction, Kat. Uh, so for, for those of you joining in, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'd be happy to answer questions along the way. Um, so put it in the chat, or Kat, if you see any raised hands, please just ping me. Um, I will do right, it. So this is work done over the last, um, I'd say, six or seven years um, on the design of uh, active and passive flow control techniques for wall-bounded turbulence. Um, and the motivation here is, uh, perhaps I don't need to spend too much time on it, it given the audience, but the motivation essentially um, comes from large-scale transportation systems. So turbulence accounts for over 50% of total drag uh, on airplanes, on ship hulls, uh, inside pipelines. And uh, as a result, there are substantial economic and environmental benefits associated with even minor um, reductions in drag. And this, of course, has motivated a large body of work on both uh, active and passive drag reduction techniques for wall-bounded turbulent flows. Um, so by active uh, control techniques, uh, I, um, I mean techniques that involve some sort of actuation, and the actuation can be open loop, so without any sensor input, or it might be in the form of a feedback active control where there's a sensor and the actuator does something in, res in response to a sense quantity, right? And passive drag reduction is one in which there are no sensors or actuators involved. Uh, in today's talk, I'm gonna focus primarily on two very um, uh, almost canonical uh, active and passive control techniques. The active control technique is called opposition control. Uh, this was one of the earliest proposed and is probably the most studied uh, active feedback flow control technique, uh, first proposed by Choi Moin and Kim in 1994. Uh, and essentially how this technique works is as follows. So there's um, a sensor located at some distance YD above the wall, right? So this can be a, a pipe wall, this can be a channel wall, this can be a boundary layer wall. And this uh, detector, uh, measures the vertical, the wall normal component of velocity. The idea here is that this sensor should be able to pick up the vertical velocities in, uh, generated by these counter-rotating streamwise vortices, SV, um, that are prevalent uh, in wall-bounded flows. And there's some actuation presumed at the wall, and that actuation opposes the measured vertical motion. So if you see downward uh, motion at your sensor, there's upward motion at the wall, right? And this study, uh, this uh, active flow control technique has been studied in simulations extensively. The work of Choi Moin, Moin and Kim showed that um, as much as 25% drag reduction is possible with opposition control, uh, so long as the sensor location is chosen appropriately. So in, in terms of viscous unit, so you'll see a lot of pluses here um, and uh, in the talk today. These pluses uh, represent normalization with the so-called uh, inner scale, so viscosity and friction velocity, right? Uh, and and um, if the sensor is, is located appropriately, so in this case, about 15 viscous units above the wall, you get as much as 25% drag reduction. And then beyond this optimal sensor location, there's a substantial deterioration of performance and an increase in drag. The passive control technique that I'm going to focus on involves the use of riblets. So these are streamwise along aligned structures uh, placed on the wall. And they work uh, primarily because of their anisotropy. They provide relatively low resistance to the mean flow in the streamwise direction, but they do provide uh, substantial resistance to the turbulent cross flows uh, that appear near the wall. So these riblets push the turbulent cross flows above the wall, weaken them, and um, thereby leading to drag reduction. So there have been uh, many beautiful experiments and simulations um, looking at the effects of riblets since the mid-80s, uh, 
And these broadly show uh, performance curves that look a little like this, where initially there is an increase in uh, drag reduction, so performance improves with increasing riblet size. Here, this is the spacing between riblets, again, with the same viscous normalization. And then beyond a certain optimum size, around 15 to 20 viscous units in terms of spacing, performance deteriorates again. Now, what I'll be talking about today, um, or what I'll be presenting today, are computationally tractable models that can reproduce some of these previous observations, provide physical insight, and perhaps more importantly, be used to design flow control. And uh, by computationally tractable models, I mean models that can uh, be run very quickly on, on routine uh, systems, so a laptop or a workstation. So if we are to develop these reduced complexity models, uh, and we're looking at broadbanded nonlinear turbulent flows, the question then arises, where do we start? How do we go about looking at this, uh, this complex flow field that is nonlinear, that has a range of time and length scales? How do we come up with reduced complexity models um, to account for all of this uh, complicated flow physics? Well, it, it turns out that um, uh, despite the broadbanded nature of well-bounded turbulent flows, uh, there is some underlying coherence. Uh, so for example, it's, it's well known that very close to the wall, um, there's a dynamically important uh, near wall cycle, that's NW throughout this talk. And this near wall cycle uh, essentially comprises uh, streamwise elongated structures that are counter-rotating. So these are counter-rotating uh, quasi-streamwise vortices. And these give rise to alternating streaks of positive and negative uh, streamwise velocity. And if you look at um, if you look at uh, you know measurements of turbulent flow in in spectral space, uh, this near wall cycle is associated with a distinct uh, spectral footprint. In other words, it it has length scales, uh, so a streamwise wavelength lambda x, uh, as well as a spanwise wavelength lambda z, that is reasonably well characterized. It's about a thousand viscous units long in the streamwise direction. Uh, and some of these structures can be about 100 viscous units uh, wide in the spanwise direction. And then as, as you go to higher Reynolds number, additional larger scale structures, uh, such as the so-called very large scale and large scale motions uh, also become important. But for now, uh, what we're going to do is consider the effect of control on just some of these key features. So instead of looking at the full flow field, We'll try and identify simple surrogate models for the near wall cycle, um, and then look at the effect of control on just this surrogate model rather than the full flow field. And to isolate these key features, we're essentially going to make use of uh, an, uh, a linear input output analysis. Um, so we're gonna make use of the resolvent framework, and I'm going to just spend really one slide uh, outlining how this works. Um, so we start with the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. Um, uh, so here we have uh, a capital U, which is the mean flow, and the turbulent fluctuation around this, which is lowercase u. And with the Reynolds uh, average Navier-Stokes equations for the fluctuations, we can, we can write it in this following simplified form. On the left-hand side, we have essentially the linear components, um, so linearized about the mean flow. And on the right-hand side, we have the nonlinearity, the convective nonlinearity. And in the context of this input-output framework, this convective nonlinearity is essentially treated as a forcing. It exists, but we don't care too much about the details of this forcing. So we start with the Reynolds average Navier Stokes equations. Uh, since we're looking at um, well-bounded turbulent flows, uh, it's reasonable to assume stationarity in time and approximate homogeneity in the streamwise direction X and in the spanwise direction Z. And so we can Fourier transform in X, Z, or Z, as we like to call it here in the US, and time, which means that we can uh, express our, our forcing response form of the Navier-Stokes equations um, in Fourier space. So we can express for each wave number frequency combination, so wave numbers kappa x, kappa z for streamwise and spanwise direction and frequency omega, we can express um, our Navier-Stokes equations in this linear input input-output 
or forcing response form. So F sub K is the Fourier transform nonlinearity, U sub K is the Fourier transform, uh, transform velocity response. And this here uh, represents a mapping between FK and UK. And specifically, when we take this term in the parentheses over to the right-hand side, we get a transfer function HK, which I'm gonna call the resolvent operator that maps the forcing to a velocity at that wave number frequency combination. Now this uh, resolvent operator, it turns out is essentially just a, uh, uh, for each wave number frequency combination, it turns out it's, it's a relatively small matrix. It's something that depends on how, um, how detailed you want to discretize in the wall normal direction. But essentially, it's, it's a matrix that you can put together in MATLAB. The code is no more complicated than that for an or Sommerfeld stability analysis or, or something like that. Um, uh, and once we establish this forcing response transfer function, this HK, we can identify high gain forcing and response modes uh, by making use of a singular value decomposition. So we, we, we put together our, um, our HK, this transfer function, this resolvent operator. You can choose your favorite discretization method for the wall normal direction. And then once we put together this matrix HK, we take a singular value decomposition that identifies a series of left singular vectors, these size, right singular vectors, these phi's, and um, singular values, sigmas. So essentially what this gives us is a set of forcing and response modes. So forcing uh, uh, along the direction of phi k1 will give rise to a velocity response along the direction of psi k1 with forcing response gain sigma k1, right? And so you can think of psi k1 as being a, a high gain flow field or a flow structure, and the sigma k1 as being the forcing response gain. And this sigma is also a measure of energy amplification, and we'll use this sigma, which I'll call gain, um, as a measure of performance for the rest of this talk. Right, so we started with our forcing response representation of our Navier-Stokes equations. We look primarily at the linear dynamics. Uh, we then Fourier transform, because we're looking at uh, uh, approximately homogeneous uh, flows in streamwise and spanwise directions and, and uh, stationary flows in time. And then we can uh, discretize our forcing response transfer function and pursue an SVD. And as I mentioned previously, uh, all of this is, is relatively straightforward, maybe a few hundred lines of code in MATLAB. I should say that this, uh, this uh, resolvent form formulation and the, and, and the approach that I outlined here has been pursued by many researchers, um, uh, you know, many, many researchers since some seminal work done by Trefethen et al. in the early 1990s. And there's a great review article by my colleague Mihailo Jovanovic um, in 2020 that goes over some of the subtleties of these linear input-output analyses. Uh, and, the, and, and the specific formulation that I use here is borrowed from McKeon and Sharma 2010. Okay, so essentially what we're gonna do is coming back to this picture, we're just going to consider the effect of control on rank one resolvent modes. What do I mean by rank one resolvent modes? I mean, we're only going to keep track of this first uh, singular, the, the first response mode and this first singular value. And that's because we find over and over again that the first singular value tends to be much, much higher than subsequent singular values for wave number frequency combinations that are energetic in natural flows which means that we can get away with this rank one approximation. This first, uh, if there is any forcing uh, along the direction of phi k, we expect this first response mode to dominate. So we'll just keep track of psi k1 and sigma k1 for the rest of this talk. Okay, so we're just gonna look at these rank one resolvent modes with wave number frequency combinations that are known to be important. For example, the near wall cycle. So what does one of these rank one resolvent modes look like? So uh, here I'm looking at the resolvent mode for a wave number of frequency combination corresponding to a streamwise wavelength of about a thousand viscous units, a spanwise wavelength of hundred viscous units and a mode speed of 10 viscous units. So these are parameters roughly consistent with the near wall streaks. 
By construction, this resolvent mode is, is a Fourier mode in X and in Z. But the structure that you get in the wall normal direction arises naturally from the gain based decomposition. So we see in the span wise wall normal plane, we see evidence of these counter rotating vortices. Uh, and we see evidence of inclined structures in the streamwise wall normal direction. And all of these features are qualitatively consistent with what is known um, of the near wall cycle. All right, so this is just the rank one resolving mode. This is what we get over a smooth wall and associated with this, uh, this rank one resolvent mode is a gain value, right? Now let's look at the effect of control on just this mode. Uh, so today what we're gonna look at is, is both opposition control and riblets and we're gonna look at it from the lens of this resolvent framework. First, let's start with opposition control. So I already showed earlier that opposition control uh, uh, can can be quite effective as has been shown to be quite effective in simulations as much as 25 percent drag reduction has been observed in simulations for appropriately chosen sensor locations and then more recent work by Chung and Talha shows that um, some of this drag uh, increase this performance deterioration for higher sensor locations can be alleviated by reducing the amplitude of the blowing and suction so for example uh, what this plot here is showing is that as you raise the sensor plane, if you blow at, let's say, only 20 or 30% of the sensed wall normal velocity, you can get back some of the performance deterioration. So instead of getting drag increases, you might get some drag decrease, even though it's not as large as the 25% observed for the classic opposition control with A of 1. So let's see if we can reproduce some of these trends uh, in using our, our resolvent-based uh, framework. Okay. So this is the rank one resolvent mode that I showed previously. This is for a smooth wall. To account for the effect of opposition control, we essentially just changed the boundary conditions before formulating our resolvent operator. So instead of um, applying a, a no vertical velocity at the wall, we say that the vertical velocity at the wall is um, the is is minus the vertical velocity sensed at yd the detector uh, the detection plane so we instead of having our classic resolvent operator we now have this modified resolvent operator hk tilde that accounts for the effect of opposition control and then we can do an uh, a singular value decomposition as before and, and see see what happens to both the mode structure and the mode gain so this is no control case this is opposition control. Uh, these are predictions for opposition control with the optimal detector location. So YD plus of 15. And what we see here is because of the blowing and suction imposed uh, at the wall, these, these structures, the, the Fourier structures shown here. So these on the top here are isocontours of streamwise velocity. Uh, they're pushed up above the wall. And what's uh, maybe a little bit clearer in the bottom image here, uh, you, where the vectors show the, the spanwise and wall normal velocity and the colors show the streamwise velocity, you see that there is clear evidence. Well, first of all, that we've imposed the boundary condition appropriately. We see uh, blowing and suction at the wall that opposes the sensed motion. And because of this blowing and suction, the counter rotating vortices are displaced upwards and there is a virtual wall established somewhere between the true wall and the detector location, the sensor location over here. There's this virtual wall. And qualitatively, this is consistent with uh, what is observed previously. Um, more importantly, with this appropriately chosen detector location, we see a, suppress a suppression in the gain. So the singular value associated with this resolving mode reduces by as much as 40%. So if I'm Keeping the same color bars on left to, from left to right, we see that this mode is suppressed significantly because of the effects of opposition control. And as I mentioned previously, there is the establishment of a virtual wall, and this is consistent with what is known uh, from previous simulations, both from the Choi Moin and Kim work and uh, subsequent work by Hannon, Bewley, and Moin in 1998. So, so far, so good. We've got qualitative consistency, we are seeing that opposition control uh, both establishes a virtual wall and it suppresses this energetically important near wall cycle uh, 
can we say anything else? Can we um, say anything about overall drag reduction, not just what happens to the single near wall mode? So to estimate integrated effects, we expand the scope of our work a little bit more. Instead of looking at just the near wall mode, we look at um, we essentially look at uh, modes across spectral space, right? So uh, we keep the rank one approximation, but what we assume is broadband forcing. We assume that there is some forcing along the first forcing mode that appears from our resolvent operator. And what this means is that at every wave number frequency combination, our velocity response is, uh, has amplitude sigma and, and has the mode structure that emerges naturally from the resolvent. Right? And so once we have that, we can calculate Reynolds stresses. We can calculate changes in Reynolds stresses. This is what I'm showing here. These tiles are essentially integrations of the Reynolds stress contributions from resolvent modes across spectral space. And then we can estimate drag reduction um, by essentially computing, by uh, calculating uh, the change in Reynolds stress for the control case, this tau tilde, uh, relative to the uncontrolled case and making use of the so-called uh, FIK identity, the Fukugata Ibamoto Kasagi identity that was proposed in 2002. Essentially, the change in Reynolds shear stress because of control leads to a change in drag. So this, this is the, this is, these are the high fidelity data that I showed previously. Let's see what our simple model predicts for the same uh, conditions. So DNS is shown here and model predictions are shown here. And this is now integrated drag reduction. For the model, this is computed based on the change in Reynolds stress. And what we see is that we reproduce the trends reasonably well, although there is a substantial quantitative difference. So we predict a maximum drag reduction of about six or so percent, uh, while in DNS, a maximum drag reduction of about 25% was observed. But the zero crossing is reasonably close and the, the optimal sensor location is also reasonably close. And again, we show um, using our simple model that this reduced blowing and suction helps. Essentially, if you move your sensor location further up above the wall, the reduction in blowing and suction strength leads alleviate some of the performance deterioration you see over here, right? So not perfect, but we made the simplest possible assumptions we could to arrive at these predictions. We assumed rank one resolvent mode. So we truncated our resolvent operator to just keep the first singular vectors and singular values that we got after the SVD. We assume broadband forcing, meaning we assume unit energy forcing along the first, um, the right singular vectors for each wave number frequency combination. And there was no feedback to you. We didn't look at the effect of the change in Reynolds stress on the mean profile. We just used that change in Reynolds stress to estimate a drag reduction. So there were substantial simplifications, but we still, we still reproduce trends reasonably well. What's um, interesting now also is that um, this framework can provide physical insight as to why you might see drag increases as you move the sensor plane further away from the wall. So there's a lot happening in these plots here, but essentially what I'm showing here is the drag contribution from resolvent modes with different streamwise wavelengths and different mode speeds. So you can think of this as, as modes that are short at the, at the bottom end here and modes that are long or large at the top end here and modes that are localized close to the wall at on the left and modes that are further away from the wall on the right. Blue represents a suppression of the modes and red represents an amplification of the modes. And this, this, uh, this vertical line here is a representation of, um, of the mean velocity essentially uh, at the detector. So this, this represents uh, the mode speed corresponding to the detector location. And what we see now is, is the following. We see that there's a straight line that delineates regions where the modes are suppressed and regions where the modes are further amplified. And um, when the detector is located relatively close to the wall, so when yd plus in this case is, is at 10, um, we see that there's no effect on these faster moving modes over here. 
And remember, these faster moving modes are localized further away from the wall. They, these modes tend to localize um, where the mode speed matches the local mean velocity. And so essentially, these are all of these modes that are further from the wall, and they're essentially not sensed at the detector. So these modes are not affected, which is why you see these swaths of no change in amplification or suppression. Now, when you move your detector plane further up, you start to detect more modes, but some of these modes are suppressed. So modes to the left-hand side of this dashed line are suppressed, and modes to the right-hand side of this dashed line are further amplified. And it turns out that the suppression to amplification uh, transition is essentially determined by whether the modes are attached to the wall or not. So if the modes have a footprint at the wall, opposition control, so you can think of these as turbulent structures, if these turbulent structures are, have a footprint at the wall, opposition control can have a, a useful influence that, on them. It can, opposition control can suppress them. However, if the modes are detached from the wall, if they're located far from the wall, and you sense the velocities produced by these modes and you generate additional blowing and suction at the wall, you're not really affecting these modes, you're just creating additional turbulence on the bottom. And this, is, uh, this leads to an additional amplification of these modes. So there's a transition uh, between attached modes being suppressed and detached modes being amplified when you dig deeper into the effects of opposition control in spectral space. What's also nice is that we can now look at, um, we can now use this low cost modeling framework to design. So in, in addition to varying the amplitude of the blowing and suction, we can also think about the phase. Maybe we can introduce a phase offset between what is being sensed and what is being produced at the wall. And so with a zero phase offset, so this dash red line here, there is, uh, uh, this is classical opposition control. You're opposing what is sensed. But what we see is that if you introduce a phase offset, if you have a phase offset that's negative, you can, uh, you can improve performance. So if your uh, amplitude of blowing and suction is offset in space or in time, uh, you, can, you can improve performance relative to classical opposition control. So these were predictions that, that we made in, in 2014. And since then, uh, my collaborators, Beverly McKeon and, and Simon Tiltley, went through and actually uh, pursued DNS for this phase shifted opposition control. And again, while there's not uh, an exact uh, quantitative match, what they see in the direct numerical simulations in terms of trends matches very closely uh, the resolvent predictions. So as you, uh, introduce negative phase offsets, you get an improvement in performance. Of course, in DNS, they see larger drag reductions compared to what is predicted by the resolvent model. But overall, the, the trends are, are quite similar in, in both plots, including this region over here to the right, where you introduce a positive phase shift, where there's a massive increase in drag uh, with the phase shifted opposition control. The key advantage here is essentially that these resolvent-based predictions took about 70 hours on a laptop. You know, we, despite the fact that we integrated over spectral space, we looked at a bunch of sensor locations, we looked at a bunch of phase offsets. Because of the computational um, uh, simplicity of the resolvent framework, all of this was done relatively quickly. Uh, of course, the DNS takes a lot longer, um, and in this case, the, there were roughly two orders of magnitude uh, difference in terms of time. And of course, this was on a cluster rather than a single, uh, than a simple laptop or a, or a workstation. And then since then, I've, I've worked with uh, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Koji Fukagata um, in, at Keio University. And we've also made use of the resolvent framework to see if uh, we can develop active control schemes in which the sensing is done purely at the wall. So instead of opposition control, which requires off-wall sensing, what happens when we make use of so-called suboptimal control techniques where the sensor is not at the optimal location, but it's instead at the wall? What if you're sensing shear stresses or pressures at the wall? What can we do uh, to optimize uh, control techniques? So again, we made use of the resolvent framework to try and develop new control laws for this uh, wall-based sensing um, control. 
And what we saw is that uh, with the new control law, we were able to, to generate a substantial improvement in performance. So um, the, the previously proposed control law only generated maybe a couple of percent in terms of drag reduction, but the new control law that was developed with uh, insight from the resolvent framework led to as much as a 10 or 12% uh, decrease in, in friction. Okay, so that, that brings me to uh, an end on the, um, on the active flow control. And for the next 15 minutes or so, maybe 20 minutes, I was going to talk about uh, riblets, but maybe this is, this is a good time to take a break and see if there are any questions on the active flow control component. Um, yeah, I have one question. Sure. So in the resolvent analysis, you gave a mean flow. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Yes, correct. So when we introduce the control, mean flow will be changed. Yes. So did you change the mean flow or so just we, you? We kept the we kept the baseline smooth wall mean flow. So again, this was this was one of the the simplest model assumption we could make. So all the predictions I showed thus far did not uh, change the base flow uh, used to create uh, used to calculate the resolvent operator. I see. Yeah. Um, but but that's a good point, uh, Kingo, because uh, for the riblets, the work that I'm going to present now, uh, we do need to take into account the effect of riblets on the base flow. And so mm -hmm. for the riblets, what we do is we uh, make use of an established analytic eddy viscosity model. It's the SES eddy viscosity profile or the reynolds Tiedermann eddy viscosity profile. We make use of that above the tips of the riblets. And then for the riblet, for the flow in the riblet grooves, we assume laminar flow. So we assume molecular viscosity and we smoothly match the, the solutions. Um, I see. So we, we predict the base flow. Uh, yeah, using using an eddy viscosity model okay. for the riblets, and yeah, I'll show that in a yeah, there was a bit of a spoiler of the second part. So. Yeah, that's okay. That, yeah. that was a really good question. Um, oh, the previous slide, uh, all all the results on on opposition control and suboptimal control uh, were simulations, and I know there's been some beautiful uh, recent experiments. Uh, by by Marusik et al. looking at spanwise oscillations and drag reduction, particularly with spanwise oscillations targeting large scale structures. But yeah, so far uh, we've only looked at uh, simulation results, no experiments. Very good. Other questions? No? Okay, so in that case, let me move on to riblets. Uh, I already introduced uh, riblets. These are streamwise elongated uh, features uh, on the wall. And the reason they, they reduce drag is essentially because of their anisotropy. They provide minimal resistance to the, uh, the mean flow in the streamwise direction, but they, they do provide resistance to the turbulent cross flows, for example, from the near wall cycle uh, and um, offset the turbulence up above the true wall. And there have been many, many beautiful experiments, particularly by Becker et al. Um, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s that looked at the effects of different uh, riblet geometries, so trapezoidal, triangular, blade-like riblets. Um, and in general, the, the drag reduction curves they see look a little like this. They, initially, there's an increase in drag reduction with increasing riblet size. There's a clear optimum uh, for a spacing of about 15 viscous units. And then beyond a certain point, the performance degrades. Now, early work uh, essentially uh, attributed the, the degradation of, of performance with uh, uh, essentially with um, what happens uh, very close to the very close to the riblet tips. For cases cases in which there was a drag decrease. Uh, a laminar flow was maintained within the riblet grooves and the vortices, um, for example, the quasi-streamwise vortices um, were pushed up above the tips of the riblets. Now, as in normalized terms, as the riblet size, increase, uh, riblet size increases, these vortices start interacting more with the groove geometry and even start penetrating into the groove geometry. And so the laminar state is no longer maintained within the, vis uh, within the within the grooves of the riblets, 
and this eventually leads to an increase in drag. So this was um, this was what was uh, what was thought up until um, about 2010, 2011 or so. At which point, Ricardo Garcia Mayoral and Javier Jimenez um, showed in direct numerical simulation that uh, in addition to this this lodging effect um, within the grooves, uh, there's also the emergence of spanwise coherent structures over riblets. So this now shows a, a snapshot of the vertical velocity field in the streamwise spanwise direction. And what you see is the emergence of spanwise coherent structures with a streamwise wavelength of about 150 viscous units. And Garcia Mayoral and Javier Jimenez associated with the emergence of these spanwise rollers with a Kelvin Helmholtz type of instability mechanism. So let's see if we can reproduce some of these features using the resolvent framework. We've seen the near wall mode previously. Now let's introduce the effect of riblets. And specifically, I'm gonna look at rectangular riblets here. Uh, rectangular riblets where the riblet uh, width is one quarter of the spacing and riblet height is one half of the spacing and will systematically increase spacing to look at different riblet sizes. So we introduce the effect of these riblets in our resolvent operator. We modify the base flow and the effect of riblets is embedded in the resolvent operator, essentially using um, a volume penalization method. This is a linear immerse boundary method. And this is what we see in terms of the gain for this single near wall mode over riblets of varying size. So these are now rectangular riblets of varying size. And what you see again is this nice U-shaped curve. Initially, as size increases, you see a suppression in gain. And remember, we think of this as being indicative of drag reduction performance. There's an optimum at an S plus of about 20, beyond which point performance starts degrading again. And this degradation in performance uh, is associated with a transition from uh, a structure where the vortices, these quasi streamwise vortices are just pushed up above the grooves to the vortices starting to interact more with the grooves. Essentially, the flow becomes less narrow banded and starts penetrating into the groove area. Right. We can actually look at um, near wall cycle uh, gain versus drag reduction. Right? So these are model predictions on the left for near wall cycle gain. And on the right are DNS results from Garcia Mayoral and Jimenez for drag reduction over these rectangular riblets. Um, the the x-axes are, are somewhat different. So on the left, I'm just plotting the spacing. And on the right, Garcia Mayoral and Jimenez plot drag reduction as a function of groove cross-sectional area, this LG plus. So this LG plus essentially represents the square root of groove cross-sectional area. You can think of this as being a, a length scale that's ana analogous to a hydraulic diameter, for example. Okay. So what, um, what Garcia Mayoral and Jimenez see is that there's maximum drag reduction for a spacing of about 20 von viscous units. So that's an LG plus of about 13 or so. And then drag uh, reduction deteriorates beyond that. And for S plus of 33, there is even an increase in drag over these rectangular riblets. And it turns out that this S plus of 21 corresponds pretty closely to the minimum in gain for the near wall cycle, right? So the gain for just this single wall, a single resolvent mode seems to be a good predictor of at least the optimal size of these riblets. It doesn't capture the increase in drag, for example. So uh, see for a uh, spacing of zero, essentially you've got smooth wall conditions, even at an S plus of 33, there's a the resolvent um, framework predicts a reduction in gain corresponding to smooth wall conditions, while for DNS there is an increase in drag relative to smooth wall conditions. So clearly, the single near wall resolvent mode doesn't capture all the flow physics, but at least it captures the minimum reasonably well. So then we can go ahead and uh, oh, and this is this is a, a comparison of structure. Uh, predicted mode structure for S plus of 21 and S plus of 33. So drag reducing case, drag increasing case. And as I'd mentioned previously, there's qualitative consistency with the previous visualizations. So for cases in which drag is reduced, the quasi streamwise vortices are pushed up above the riblets. For cases in which drag increases, 
there is greater interaction between these vortices and the grooves, and there's penetration into the groove area. We can also test for the emergence of uh, these fanwise coherent rollers using the resolvent framework. Essentially, we look at the emergence, we look at gain for modes with uh, spanwise wave number zero, so infinite spanwise wavelength. And these are gain maps for riblets of different sizes, again, rectangular riblets. And what I'm plotting is the log of gain for different streamwise wave, uh, wavelengths and different mode speeds. And this is for an S plus of 12. So in the drag reducing regime, S plus of 21, the optimal case, and S plus of 28, which is when performance starts to deteriorate. And what we see is that the resolvent framework predicts the emergence of structures with a streamwise wavelength of about 130 viscous units. So there's a localized peak here um, that matches very closely with the, with the wavelengths observed in direct numerical simulation. So we're able to pick out the emergence of these high gain spanwise rollers. We can return to our model predictions shown here for the gain of the near wall cycle. Now keep in mind that the gain for this near wall mode is about three, right? The units don't matter, the gain is three. Now let's take a look at the gain for the highest amplified spanwise structure uh, for riblets of increasing size. And what we see is that initially the spanwise constant structures have very low gain, well below the three threshold. But right at the point where you see a large a deterioration in performance and eventually an increase in drag, you see a huge jump in the gain for these spanwise coherent rollers, uh, starting with the lambda x of about 130 viscous units and then increasing in wavelength. And for the case where S plus is 33, so firmly into the drag increase regime, you see that the gain for these spanwise coherent rollers is as much as a factor of 10 higher than the gain for these the near wall mode. So at least in a qualitative sense, the resolvent framework seems to predict that the drag increase can be attributed to the emergence of these spanwise rollers, even if the initial, um, uh, initial improvement in performance with increasing size can be captured by the near wall mode. And oh, by the way, there's some beautiful uh, recent work um, based on numerical simulations on the emergence of, of Kelvin Helmholtz rollers uh, over riblets. Um, and this is work by Andrew Cutt et al. 2021. And it turns out that there's some really interesting subtleties on the effect of riblet shape on the emergence of these Kelvin Helmholtz rollers. So I'd, I'd recommend checking this out. Okay, but let's let's get back to riblets, right? So it seems like the single near wall resolvent mode uh, captures the minimum in uh, captures the optimal drag reduction reasonably well. So we can actually make use of this for optimization. So we can find shapes that minimize the gain for the near wall resolvent mode. We can do this in a brute force fashion. So just vary shapes, sizes, things like that. Again, we see that uh, uh, for both trapezoidal and triangular riblets, spacings of about uh, 20 or so viscous units and angles that are low, so you've got sharp tips, um, those tend to be optimal. And we can do this over a range of different geometries, triangles, trapezoids, blades, et cetera. And what we see is that the model predictions for the optimal uh, riblet size now expressed in terms of that LG length scale, the groove area length scale, matches pretty closely with the data compiled by Garcia Mayoral and Jimenez. But perhaps what's even more uh, interesting or perhaps a better way to proceed in terms of optimization is to actually do it formally. Right? So we can parameterize riblet geometry uh, using splines or Bezier curves, and then we can optimize those parameters to minimize the gain for the near wall resolvent mode. And this is just a little animation showing that optimization. Um, and we see that the optimal shapes predicted by the framework are, tend to be these these scallop types of shapes, which is again consistent with uh, what is known from previous experiments and simulations. And what's nice is we can we can potentially also introduce uh, manufacturing constraints. So instead of having really sharp tips, we can introduce finite radiuses of curvature at the tips and so forth. Right. So the key point here is that this is a relatively low cost um, way to do some preliminary geometry optimization before testing in higher fidelity simulations or uh, lab experiments. 
Okay, so that essentially takes me to the to the end of my talk. Um, uh, what I'd like to, uh, uh, these are the key conclusions. The extended uh, resolvent framework can be a powerful design and analysis tool for passive and active turbulence control. The key advantages are low computational cost, um, the direct link to the Navier-Stokes equations. We start from the Navier-Stokes equations to formulate a resolvent operator. And there are no real uh, Reynolds number penalties in terms of computational cost. High Reynolds numbers are possible. Of course, there are some disadvantages. Um, the, the first one is the requirement of a mean profile. right? So in, for the work that I showed so far, we essentially used a smooth wall, no control mean profile, or uh, generated simple and made use of simple models to predict the mean profile. Uh, for things like riblet geometry, we had to make use of a truncated Fourier uh, series representation. So the riblet geometry was not captured exactly. So it's not captured as well as you might capture it in you know, simulations uh, uh, where the mesh is fitted to the geometry. And of course, the, the resolvent framework because of its linear, um, because it's linear in 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 philosophy, cannot account for secondary flows or other nonlinear effects. And the secondary flows uh, produced by dispersive stresses over riblets are again known to be uh, important in terms of uh, of uh, modifying uh, performance. The one other thing that we're actually doing uh, using very similar um, using a very similar approach is is looking at the effect of uh, anisotropic porous materials. Um, so work by Gomez de Segura and Garcia Mayoral shows that um, if appropriately designed anisotropic porous materials could function similarly to riblets and reduce drag. So if you have a porous material that provides minimal resistance to the streamwise flow but does provide lots of resistance to the wall normal flow or the, the turbulent cross flow, you can get drag reduction and potentially much larger drag reductions compared to riblets. And what we've shown um, uh, recently is that the resolvent framework is able to reproduce trends in drag reduction from simulations, again, in terms of gain. So the gain for the near wall mode matches um, the shift in the mean profile, essentially a surrogate for drag reduction from simulations. Uh, and the, the performance depends on the difference between the streamwise and spanwise permeabilities, which essentially represents streamwise and spanwise resistances to flow in these porous materials. Again, over these porous uh, materials, the emergence of spanwise rollers is important and the resolvent framework is able to capture the emergence of these structures. And what we're trying to do is, is, is design porous materials here that have the appropriate permeabilities and test them in lab experiments. So I should say about 60% of my lab is, is modeling work, about 40% is lab experiments. Today I presented primarily modeling work, but we, we do lab experiments that look at uh, turbulence control as well as some uh, fluid structure interaction problems. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna close my presentation. I'd like to acknowledge uh, really the, the people that did the work, um, Andrew Chaverin in particular, uh, led a lot of the resolvent development for, uh, for porous materials and riblets. Christoph uh, did some preliminary experiments on the anisotropic porous materials, and then other members in my group contributed just uh, intellectually and supported Christoph and Andrew. I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, Beverly McKeon, Ati Sharma, uh, and Koji Fukagata, as well as uh, as funding from the Air Force, Navy, and, and uh, uh, the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. And if anybody's interested in playing a, uh, around with resolvent codes, you can find that uh, at the link below. And there's also a tutor tutorial on, on resolvent analysis at the YouTube link over here from an AIAA meeting from a few years ago. OK, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and I'll take questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Michel. That was an excellent lecture. Uh, so, so your codes are uh, open source, the resolvent codes? Yes, the yes, they are open source. They are MATLAB codes. So, you know. Oh, yeah, you need, <laughs> you need, you need a MATLAB license. license. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but That's yes, awesome. they are They are uh, publicly available. Um, there's, there's a pipe resolvent code that's up there and a channel flow resolvent code that's going to be up there in the next week or so. Yeah. Very cool. I always really appreciate it when people have open source code. That's excellent. Uh, so we do have a bit of time for questions. Um, if you're in the audience, feel free to just unmute your mic and ask, or you can put it in the chat 
or just raise your hand in the participants list. Um, I just had a quick question while people are gathering their thoughts. So you mentioned this is right at the start, we uh, introduced the resolvent formulation that you're using. So I, I don't know much about this, this topic. So are there other formulations and kind of what does this one do that, that they don't do, I guess? Um, good question. So uh, let's see. So there, um, in, in, in some sense, resolvent analysis builds on traditional stability analyses, right? So for example, it's well known that the transition from laminar to turbulent flow, um, at least for boundary layers and, and channel flows, is, is dictated by the emergence of uh, Tolman Schlichting waves, right? Uh, and so th there are people who've uh, tried to develop control techniques that uh, suppress the emergence of these Tolman Schlichting waves. It turns out that uh, even for the laminar to turbulent transition, you can have uh, other mechanisms that lead to transition. Uh, and those mechanisms involve uh, non-normality. They essentially involve transient growth. Um, and that, uh, to capture those effects, um, Trefethen et al., uh, the, the paper that I mentioned, introduced the idea of this, uh, of a pseudo spectrum. So essentially, instead of looking at instabilities, they look at a frequency response of the system. And what the resolvent analysis does is essentially makes use of a similar idea, but for turbulent flows. So instead of looking at the amplification of disturbances to a laminar flow, in this case, we're looking at amplification of the internal forcing, the nonlinearity. Does that make sense? And so it turns out that these, these counter-rotating vortices that we see in turbulent flows and fully turbulent flows are structures that, that require the minimal amount of forcing to sustain themselves. Does that no, answer your you. question? I know I, I sort of answered it, uh, perhaps no, not it good. you intended it, but yeah. It, it gave a lot more context, so that was yes, very helpful. Yeah. So the instability analyses, depending on the flow that you're interested in, depending on the key underlying physical mechanisms, uh, you might want to use stability analyses for uh, designing and analyzing control for fully turbulent flows. Um, resolvent analysis is a good start. And then there are ways to extend it to uh, introduce the effects of nonlinearities and so forth. You can uh, incorporate additional systems analysis tools to account for the fact that the nonlinearity is, is passive, so it doesn't produce energy and so forth. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for answering my probably simple question. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it, was a, it was actually a yeah, very difficult question in the end. So we have uh, someone with a hand up, so please uh, go ahead. Um, thanks, thanks, Michelle. That's a very interesting talk. Um, um, so I'm from the University of Adelaide, and um, I'm not sure, but we are working on a very similar techniques that we're trying to use. Um, initially, we started looking into Helmholtz resonators, and then we moved on to micro perforations um, because it's very hard to activate the resonator in, in the condition of a boundary layer flow. Sure. And um, we, we are we are familiar with the resolvent methods that that you're suggesting, and um, so we work with Beverly. On, oh, on this so um, sure. yeah, and then we are familiar with some of your work. So one of the interesting things that we observed recently, uh, we looked into isentropic um, perforations. Um, so so we we try just to three D print permeable structures with the design channels um, in order to somehow manipulate the boundary layer. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we we found very interesting results, which we. In general, we, we tripped the boundary layer rather than dump any of the instabilities. So um, I guess probably we take it offline and then we set up a meeting to share some of those results. Um, I, I would like to hear back your, feed, uh, your feedback on, on those results. Um, the, the, the other thing is now we are looking into a new funding applications uh, which target that primarily. So I would like to somehow pass it by you to get your feedback before we move on. So. Um, we get in sure. touch, and, and then we'll yeah, have a chat. Happy to discuss offline. Please, please get in touch. Uh, it's my last name at usc.edu. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd be happy to talk more. Yeah, and oh, and okay. I should mention that um, some of this uh, this porous material work, um, the the simulations and the models that we use uh, made use of um, made use of bulk models for the porous material. So they didn't resolve the geometry exactly, uh, 
And the exact interfacial geometry does, does play an important role. And I, we need to figure out ways to account for it. Yeah. Uh, look, I have, a, I have a question which, which I ask here before we go to like um, other meeting. Um, imagine hypothetically you can um, develop and design a method to target um, one particular wavelength, which we you know it is not possible in, in practice, but imagine that you can do that. Uh, what would you suggest that need to be done? What wavelength do you think uh, has more authority here? Uh, it, so are, are we still talking about uh, well-bounded turbulent flows? Are you thinking about transition? Are you- um, We're looking into the turbulent flows. Well-bounded well -bounded turbulent flows. I mean, I, I, I think if you are going to, my naive answer would be that if you are going to be targeting specific um, wavelengths, you should be looking at wavelengths corresponding to structures that are naturally energetic in the flow. So at low Reynolds numbers, it's the near wall cycle. As you get to higher and higher Reynolds numbers, you should be targeting either wavelengths or frequencies associated with BLSMs, LSMs, that type of thing. That would be my, my first guess. Okay, but, but there is no evidence as such. I mean, based on your research, we, we don't actually have any evidence that that is how it works. Because I remember there was an article about eight or six years ago by Cork, um, Thomas Cork, and then he actually hypothesized all this and um, explained somehow speculatively that this is what needs to be done. But since then, I haven't seen any article that, that somehow investigated this. Uh, um, so I, I do believe there's some work that, that provides some support for this hypothesis. So for example, there are simulations um, by Mihailo Jovanovic and his students. Uh, and this is, I think, for spanwise wall oscillation. So an active control technique um, that show that if you, if you match the frequency of the oscillation with the frequency of energetic structures in the flow, you can, you can suppress them and generate drag reduction. And I believe there's there's more recent work, and I think this is um, this is work by Marusik et al., which shows that if in if you oscillate at the frequencies corresponding to the larger scale structures, you can also suppress those. So I think there there are ways to target um, some of these structures and target them effectively. All right, I think Tony has his hand up. Is that right? Yes, to ask a question. Hi, uh, no, thanks. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Mitul. Um, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in how this the resolvent formulation would work when you when you don't know the boundary conditions. So, and, and this is an FSI question, right? So when you yeah. have a compliant coating, right, obviously the compliant coating is uh, has got its own dynamic dynamics. It's a wave bearing medium, mm -hmm. right? and of course it is interacting with uh, with the flow. And I could just equivalently, I mean, just in listening to the previous question about the porous wall, mm -hmm. the porous walls, uh, something similar could happen. Um, they're in the plenum chamber, um, in the cavity beneath the, uh, the pores, um, you can get uh, waves propagating in those. In fact, actually, um, there's, there's, a, there's an AIA paper by uh, Porter and Carpenter in 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, and you mentioned that that was a laminar boundary layer, suppression of Tom schlichting waves, um, but it failed at a certain point because of a resonance in the plenum chamber, um, which was a completely different instability mechanism. But just going back to, uh, but going back to say, let's take compliant walls where you need to know what the admittance is. It, you know, the pressure fluctuations in from the flow, they drive the wall motion, of course, and then that affects the, uh, the wall boundary condition on the, uh, the fluid. So can you, are you able to, to build that, let's call it an admittance, can you build that into, into your operator? Yeah, yeah, so in, in fact, uh, I, didn't, I didn't talk about compliant walls here, but I can talk about, so I can go back to the boundary condition for opposition control, for example. Um, and, and as you said, uh, essentially what, what we've done in, in the past, and this is work with, uh, with Beverly when I was a postdoc with her, what we've done is implemented an, admis ad an admittance boundary condition in the resolvent operator that links the pressure fluctuations at the wall um, with the wall normal velocity. And in addition to the, the PV relationship, there's also, uh, 
I mean, because we're essentially in a linear framework here, we also had to use some linearized kinematic conditions that, that made use of the, the mean shear at the wall. Um, but we did this, and, and as you might imagine, for you know, spring damper backed walls or spring damper backed membranes, you can, you can come up with analytic models for what that admittance uh, might be. Even for well-characterized viscoelastic media with uh, you know, known thickness, you can, you can analytically calculate what that admittance boundary condition might be. Um, and, 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 that, and that's something that, that is doable. I don't know if that answers your question. No, no that's, that's a, thanks, Mr. That's a very good answer. Um, you, of course, the, uh, the, the, the point about things like compliant walls is that they can admit their own instabilities, their own modes. That's right. right? Now, you, you know, when you, when you do a, uh, a rank one, you're essentially saying you're taking one turbulent mode, of the mode of turbulent flow. Yeah. Uh, and the inclusion, I wondered whether the inclusion, the actual, well, they, they come in uh, on a solid, on a flexible solid, they, they originate as the free waves of that solid. Yes. And yes. then the natural modes of that solid. And of course, they can be just, in fact, they have in those in experiments by Gadel Hack, you see them. Yeah. Uh, That's there, right. But, yeah. yeah, so there, and, and, and you're exactly right. What we see is, is the, it, um, so for example, the, the case that we compared our resolvent predictions against was, um, uh, was simulations over a spring damper wall. So in that case, there wasn't a free wave that can emerge, but there is a resonant frequency. Uh, and, and what you see is essentially that, the, that when you look at uh, you know, amplification of rank one resolvent modes across spectral space, there's a specific set of frequencies that lights up and that's, that's the resonant frequency. And it turns out that those modes are excited over these walls and those modes also show up um, in the resolvent analysis. We can look at the structure that emerges over this spring damper wall. And again, that's consistent with DNS. Yeah. And then as you introduce more complex walls, you can support wave propagation. And I, I expect that you know, resolvent modes with that wave number frequency combination uh, corresponding to the, the free wave might, might be ones that show up. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Very nice uh, presentation, Michelle. Thank you, yeah, really good questions. Thank you, Tom. Okay, do we have um, any other questions coming from the audience? Just let me check the chat. No, all looks good. All right, if, if there's no other questions, uh, we'll thank our speaker once again for an excellent talk and we'll let you go free. <laughs> thank you so much for, for joining us. It was fantastic. Thank you for the invitation. Right. Enjoyed it. <laughs>